You're listening to Amy Keeps It Creepy, the podcast where I share my obsession with true crime and the paranormal with you. I'm your host, Amy Brooks. Pervy spirits eager to accost women in the ladies' room. A deal with the devil made before a man explodes into flames. A leather biker dude tour guide who happens to be dead. This is Maitland Jell, a former prison that was home to some of the most evil and notorious prisoners in Australia. Today, it is said to be one of the most haunted prisons, attracting ghost hunters and paranormal thrill seekers from all over the world. Happy November, Creepsters. I hope you enjoyed our super creepy Halloween episodes in October. I know I did. I announced last month that I am packing up the family and leaving LA for a paranormal road trip across country to upstate New York. Also, upstate New York, probably one of the most ghostly places I've ever been to. But more on that later. Anyway, I filmed amazing ghost adventures that will be available on my YouTube channel. It's a brand new channel, and I am posting a new episode weekly. Please support me. Please subscribe. Go watch. It's super fun. The link is in the show notes or on my website, creepypodcast.com. We go to a pioneer cemetery in Utah, a haunted chapel in Omaha, an abandoned funeral parlor in Cleveland, and many more stops. My favorite episodes are definitely Chicago, though. That place, gosh, Chicago, it is the coolest city I think I've ever been to. Wished I lived there kind of place, but also proved to have some of the most amazing paranormal activity I have ever witnessed. Prepare to be amazed and a little creeped out. And don't forget to hit me up on my Instagram at creepy podcast or on my personal Instagram at Miss Amy Brooks. And yes, it's complicated. Thanks, mom. Amy is spelled A-I-M-E-E on Instagram, Miss Amy Brooks. I am very excited to introduce our guest, Renata Daniel, a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, renowned psychic, and owner of Newcastle Ghost Tours. She offers the most amazing paranormal tours and ghost hunts around New South Wales, as some of Australia's most haunted locations. I want to hear about all of them. But today she is joining us to speak about one of the creepiest places I have ever heard. Maitland Zhao. Hi, Renata. Hi, Amy. How are you? I am so good. I I can't wait to talk about this place. But first, for us Americans, Zhao, it's spelled G-A-O-L. Please tell our American listeners, what is a jowl? <laughs> first of all, first of all, it's pronounced goal. Oh, I, see, I'm, I'm conducting this interview and I don't even know. <laughs> goal. Okay. Oh, my Americanness is totally goal. coming out. Okay. You're going to have to crack me the whole time. You know that, right? Gowl. Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. It's pronounced goal and it really is the same as jail. J-A-I-L, although for some odd reason at some point in time, um, probably somewhere in the early 1900s, they changed the word from jail to goal. I never have heard that. That's amazing. Huh. little trivia for us tonight. Yeah, so it's Maitland Goal. Um, But often people do still call it Maitland Jail, so it really doesn't matter really doesn't matter as long as people go there. That's the most important thing. I don't care what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> but quickly, why are there so many creepy gals in prisons in Australia? I mean, there's Old Melbourne, Port Arthur, Bogo Road, Old Adelaide, Fremantle, Odubo. I mean, the list goes on and on, and they are all purported to be extremely haunted places. Well, you have to remember that Australia was actually a open-air prison to begin with. So when the English came out to settle Australia, they came out with the worst convicts that had been held in the prisons in England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And so it started as a convict settlement. Now, Newcastle, where I live, is the second oldest 
convict settlement on the mainland of Australia. So it started with Sydney and then they opened Newcastle, which was about an eight-hour trip or voyage by boat. That's the only way you could get to Newcastle in those early years. And Maitland, where the jail now sits, is about a 20-minute car ride from Newcastle. So Newcastle was the harbour port everyone wanted to go to from Sydney to get into the Hunter Valley because the Hunter Valley, um, this is going north, right? So the Hunter Valley is a very rich area of great land and um, very, very good for growing crops and having cattle. And of course, we have a great wine industry in the Hunter Valley region as well. Oh, I know all about that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love Australian wines. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Everyone was trying to get out to the Hunter Valley to uh, own land. And so, of course, a lot of the uh, richest people were settling in Maitland rather than staying in Newcastle. Newcastle was a dirty, smelly, rambunctious convict harbour where ships were coming in and people were doing trade, but they were usually moving off from Newcastle to somewhere else. And if you wanted to own land, if you wanted to have wealth in the early years, Some of the places you went to were down south to Melbourne and to Victoria, or you headed up around the Hunter Valley and into the inner New South Wales area. And so Maitland became the place where they decided to build the next big jail, and Maitland Jail opened in 1848. Oh, wow. And I'm going to post photos of it on the website, creepypodcast.com. You have to see it. It is so creepy looking. Tell me about it. So you run tours there. What is the, your relationship there, Renata? I've been doing tours at Maitland Jail for the last two and a half years. Um, and I had to actually convince them to do paranormal tours there. They had a psychic who had been running psychic tours ever since the jail closed in 1998. So Maitland Jail ran con- consistently uh, without closure at any point in time from 1848 to 1998. That's 150 years. But it, it became um, a, a place where you couldn't have uh, prisoners anymore because of its age and the facilities were just not up to scratch at all. So they closed it in 1998, and so we are just over 20 years of it being closed. And now it's really a, a museum, uh, so it is owned by the, the local city council, and, of course, it's open daily for people to come in during the day to visit um, and also to have some tours at night. So it took me about three or four years to convince them to allow me to do a paranormal tour because I kept on saying, people ask me every week if I run tours at Maitland Jail and I have to say, no, I don't. So I want to stop saying that (laughs) and I want to actually show you how beneficial it, it would be to run tours there because we know the place is haunted. Oh, yeah. There were some bad dudes there that did their time. It would not surprise (laughs) me if the bad spirits are lurking there now. I mean, they are. I know it. Just by looking at the photos. I've never been there, but I can't wait to go. (laughs) There were there were some of the worst uh, prisoners uh, in, of course, the early years. We had people who um, were murderers, rapists, every uh, robbers, every sort of shape and form in the early years. Women went into the jail as well with their children because, of course, in those years, um, a a woman couldn't leave her children out um, if there was no family to look after them. So she took her children in with them. So we certainly have stories about women and children in the jail and and children being born in the jail. Um, We had um, hangings in the jail as well. So you, in the um, early days when hangings could uh, still be done, you were only hung for either murder or rape. No, they had gruesome executions there and public hangings. Yes. Now, have do you know the area where the executions were performed? Yes, yes. There were two spots. There was one at the front gate. So if you have a photo there um, with the, the front locked gates of the jail, 
um, that's where the first hangings occurred, and they certainly were public hangings. And sometimes they actually did the hangings at uh, lunchtime so that uh, as many of the local people could take time off work to come and see the hangings. Good times, right? Good times. So much fun. <laughs> yeah. And then there was a space right at the back of the jail against the back wall where they uh, would also build a um, an area where a hanging could occur because there could be sometimes years between a hanging. So, of course, there, there wasn't um, a, one that was there all the time. So they just built it as needed. Can you imagine being a prisoner there and watching the noose go up? You know, watching it being built every time there was going to be an execution. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. They they say that the, the night before an execution of a prisoner was the most quietest night in the jail. And uh, you could actually hear the breathing of everyone as they grew more and more intense. And they used to try and send signals to each other because there was certainly a time uh, when they, they called it um, the silent method and prisoners were not allowed to talk to each other at all. They weren't even allowed to look at each other as they were passing out to do exercise or anything like that. So they developed a knocking system where they could knock on walls or um, iron in the doors and send signals to each other to the man who was going to be executed the next day um, because they their there is a particular wing of the jail, a wing, which is the oldest wing, which has two um, solitary confinement cells right down the end where men would be placed just before they were hung. And they needed to stay there for 24 or 48 hours in case they needed to see their pastor or someone was going to come and visit them for the very last time. Uh, so we, we often get a lot of activity in those cells, especially when we call out the names of those men that were hung at the jail. Sometimes there is a particular name that may be spoken and all of our gadgets start going off as if he is there to say, yep, I'm still here. I'm hearing my name. I'm just telling you that I'm, I'm here and I appreciate that you're mentioning me. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So you mentioned gadgets. Mm -hmm. What are your favorite ghost hunting gadgets that you would recommend to someone? We love to play with the SB11 because we use that, especially with our uh, people that we have, our participants, and we split them up into groups. And we have some people that come and they sit on headphones attached to the SB11 so they can hear the white noise that's coming through the SB11. So we know that that's uh, called a spirit box. And it goes through all the radio stations at a very rapid rate and creates a noise. Now, sometimes it will stop on particular radio stations and it will emit a part of a word. And so we use this as a way of communicating with the spirit. So we ask them to use or manipulate the, the voice or the noise that is coming through and send us through the words or send us through the information that they want us to know. And so we have a group that sit all around and they have headphones on and they can't see each other and they can't hear what we're asking. And we stand back and we start to ask questions while the other half of the group is standing behind us to see what this interaction is going to bring up. And sometimes we have long-winded conversations with some of these spirits that come through. Now, they tend to swear a lot, as you would in a prison community and in a site like that. So it can sometimes be very hilarious. So we do warn everyone. We say, look, I'm sorry. But if these guys start swearing, we do ask you just to say what they are saying. And... Um, we have a lot of interesting conversations that way. Oh, I bet. The prison, the tongue on the prisoners. Oh, yeah, it must get nasty. No, I couldn't be the one listening on the box because it's too close to my white noise machine. And I go to sleep to that every night. So I'd have to be the one asking the <laughs> questions because I would I'd be dozing off. Oh, that's great. So what, what do they say? What's the dirtiest thing they've said? Come on, Renata, let's hear it. Oh, I can't repeat it, but they <gasps> use the F word a lot and the C word a lot. Oh. Um, and we've, we, we, we have one particular person that comes on quite often, and he is a, a real woman hater. 
uh, and he knows us really well, so he can actually call us out by name, and um, he will tell us whether what mood he is in. And sometimes, you know, we kind of egg him on a little bit and try and get out his real character about how he hates women and women got him into the jail in the first place and he hates them all and he starts this conversation happening. And it's it's absolutely fascinating that for whatever reason and however it happens, these voices and these energies can still make themselves known in a place like that. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. It is. And, you know, I've heard about the ghost hunter chicks the groupies, they wear lingerie to prisons to kind of egg on the prisoner ghosts, try to, trying to get them to say something. Have you ever had a, a girl whip out her lingerie on one of your tours? Um, no. <laughs> no. Maybe that's just a California thing, but the, <laughs> the, the ghost tours in California, these women, they wear lingerie to egg on the ghost men. Isn't that nuts? Right. Scandalous. I guess they really, I would really, <laughs> mm, no, no. Not no. me. I would never do That's just scandalous. That's beyond. <laughs> you guys have different rules from us. <laughs> I guess so. Oh, yeah, we do. We're crazy here. But let's talk about being a sensitive person and being a psychic. Death, brutality, evil, they still hang in the air there. What does it feel like for you to go to a place like that? Are you able to shut it off in your head? Um, I'm all about exploring. So if I'm feeling an energy coming through, I want to see why it feels the way it feels and what it's trying to communicate with me. So I have a distinct way that spirit comes towards me or makes themselves known. I have a very physical sensation so that I know that an energy is next to me or trying to speak to me in some way. So I then tend to try and focus in on that. And to me, um, they're, the way they come through doesn't really matter. So I don't necessarily get scared if there is an angry kind of energy being presented because my my sense is, well, why are you angry? Can you tell me why? Can you let me explore that and let's have let's let's have a conversation so that I know why this is happening. But certainly there are energies that are very, very strong and you can really feel a force when they are close by. And there are certainly energies that are a lot weaker or come in very quietly and and present themselves very, very differently. So to me, it's all still exploration. And um, I I approach it from a non-judgmental point of view. And I just try and get as much information from that energetic side that's coming through um, and kind of not be scared or run, if you know what I mean, because that's not going to help me at all. No, but I'm a scaredy cat. I just am. So you're a lot braver than I am. But tell me about the experiences that you've had or that your other tour operators have had there. Right. So we, um, and I'm going to go back to talk about Anne because Anne took one of my tours when I was overseas um, some time ago. And uh, as I said, we, we have a lot of experiences there and people will have personal experiences. As you know, sometimes there can be groups of 20 or 25 people and yet it's only one person in the group that seems to be the focal point on a particular night. So we've had personal experience. But they're not wearing lingerie. <laughs> no, no. They've been pushed against walls. They've, oh, um, that's one scary. One young man had his jacket ripped in one place. Actually, the pocket of his jacket ripped, and he said it was a new jacket. He just purchased it. Um, we've had doors close on people while they've been inside a cell, <gasps> and they found it difficult oh. to, to reopen. Um, we've had um, very audible walking along staircases. Uh, we've had people being taken over by an energy and they've literally become a channel for them without even knowing. Um, we've had to call an ambulance once for a lady who really became overcome by a particular energy um, at uh, one of our evenings. And we had to call an ambulance for her because we weren't quite sure whether she was actually having a heart attack <laughs> or whether she was possessed. 
So we always wow. kind of go, let's just make sure we're doing the right thing by this person and not assume. So we'll just get an ambulance. <laughs> wow. I had no idea. Your profession is so dangerous. You need to be first aid trained. <laughs> We need to be trained in multiple facets of, of, um, yeah, of dealing with everyone that comes through. So all of us actually have first aid experience. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and all of us actually have mental health first aid as well. Now, I'm also a trained um, personal counsellor. So I am trained in looking at the personal dynamics of what are happen- what's happening to a person when they are on a tour or an experience. Um, and we all sort of go through paranormal and ghost hunting training. So all all of us have this kind of set of uh, gifts or experiences that we can offer to the clients that are coming through to make sure that the space is uh, safe, you know, and that everyone actually walks out having knowing that they feel comfortable, nothing is going to follow them home, which often they think might happen. Uh, and we let them all walk out knowing that everything is going to be okay. You can never let anyone leave a space like that with a sense and feeling that they are terrified. That's a really, really unprofessional thing to do. Very, very unprofessional in, in my view. But I'll, I'll, I'll go back to talk to Anne. And Anne was doing a tour uh, there one night when I wasn't there. And the group had been split up into two. And Anne was heading off to a space around the back of the jail uh, while the other group was on the other side of the jail. And as Anne was walking to a particular space, going towards the space, very, very dark space. We don't have lights on, only the emergency lights while we are at the jail. We just let everybody be in the ambience of the space. She saw a figure in front of her and she thought that it may have been someone who was lost from the other group. And she yelled out to this man and she said, excuse me, aren't you supposed to be with the other group? They're over there. And she pointed to where the other group was. And he turned around briefly and looked at her and she said, you know, if you're lost, you shouldn't have wandered off. You know, we keep people in groups. But if you could walk over to the other group, and she turned to the other group briefly, and when she turned back, this gentleman was gone. <gasps> he disappeared. And so she looked around the corners as she did, and, of course, she asked everybody else, did they see anything? And, of course, they said no. And so she went, oh, that's really weird. Anyway, at the end of the night, they, the two groups got together, and she asked the other volunteer who was leading the other group, was there this man? Now, I can't see him in your group. Was there this man that looked in this particular way? He looked a bit of a, a bike. He had a leather vest on with some badges on it and uh, you know a long uh, ponytail at the back and a receding hairline at the front and all of this sort of stuff. And the other person said, no, I didn't have anyone like that at all. And she went, I think I've just seen a full-bodied apparition, a ghost that actually heard me call to him. Wow. She left it for a while. Now, of course, everybody found out about it. And, you know, it's a story that goes on and on, and she tells it quite warmly. Um, but a, a few months later, she caught up with someone who had worked at the jail, and she told this person about the experience. He was a, a um, an ex-prison guard. And he said to her that after the jail closed, there had been in the early years another tour provider that looked exactly like the person that she described. Wow. The well-dressed gentleman with the ponytail. Oh my gosh. He's still there. He was checking out your tours because he's a tour guide too. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Making sure she's saying the right thing. Yeah, she must have been because he left. You know, he didn't step in and correct her. Wow. This month, our Patreon fan bonus episode is a special Thanksgiving murder episode featuring some of the most depraved murders committed on Turkey Day. Ew. Hey, the holidays sometimes bring out the evil in some people. It can be a stressful time. And these creepy bastards chose a side of homicide with their Thanksgiving turkey. Please pass the pumpkin pie and don't miss this episode. Available exclusively for my Patreon fans. Yes, look, we had some amazing experiences there. Really, really sort of eye-opening experiences. 
that you know people have walked in going, I'm a bit sceptic and walked out going, mm. no, I have to say I couldn't explain what happened to me tonight. And they've walked out shaking their head going, mm, I've got no way to explain what happened. But they don't leave scared because I would leave scared. I mean, I know that I wouldn't have a ghost walk, you know, jumping in my car going back to the hotel with me. But because I'm super scared of everything and everything creepy. So I would get that feeling in me if I had seen a ghost or if some if I got slammed against a wall or locked in a cell. Holy cow. Oh, they're, they're just amazing <laughs> stories. I mean, that's a super haunting. You know, you see these other shows, these ghost shows and, you know. They'll have like a little sound or a, a little EVP, but these are major experiences that you and the people you gave the tour to had. They are major. Mm. And one of the things that we do um, at the beginning of every tour is say to people, you know, if if you watch the TV shows, you have to just be aware that it's not going to be like the TV show. We can't guarantee that you will have an experience at all. Um, but we want you to enjoy the site and the history and the tales and the myths and the legends that also go with this particular site. And maybe when we tell some of those stories and introduce some of the characters that are here, it will actually bring them back. And actually they may wish to spend some time here while you were here tonight. But we can't guarantee anything. And that's the thing. We don't do any jump scares. We don't create anything um, that isn't actually happening on our tours. So our tours are called Ghost Hunting 101 and we also have an extended paranormal experience, um, for, which is a four-hour experience. And this is kind of the next step for people who aren't looking to be terrified in an experience because that's not what we offer. We offer people a genuine look at what ghost hunters will do at an investigation. So it's really cool. That is cool. And you know what? Quite honestly, those ghost hunting shows, they're making a lot of it up because, you know, they have a deadline and they have to shoot within 10 hours and get something to give to the studio. And uh, they're results oriented. So a lot of it's fabrication. That's correct. Yeah, they'll put they'll put the scary yeah. music on and they'll like move a camera and the guys will say, what was that? What was that? What was that? And there's nothing there. They're <laughs> acting. They're acting. But I, it's refreshing. I like your perspective. I like how you run the show. That's great. Yeah, well, we're truthful. We've certainly had people walk out saying that was the most boring thing I've ever been to. <laughs> We've had that. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. All right. So tell me some more creepy stories. So we have one particular cell that has a, a great myth or a great legend attached to it, and we call it Satan's Cell. And this story goes back to um, probably the last 15 years that the jail was open. And um, in the last 30, 20, 10 years that the jail was open, there were a lot of different types of people that were in the jail because, of course, everything had changed. So there were a lot of drug addicts trying to get off drugs. There were um, more sort of murderers and hardcore prisoners who were doing a life, but there were also prisoners who were in there because they were um, not mentally well. Let's say that. And there's one cell that became quite notorious in Sea Wing. Now, Sea Wing was opened up in the late, late 1800s. And it was originally opened up as a female wing. So there were only females in there. And their kids, right? And the kids, yep. That's crazy. The family unit. That's right. Oh, my goodness. In about the 1950s, all the women were moved out of that wing and they went to a prison called Darlinghurst Prison in Sydney. And there were no more women kept in Maitland Jail. It became a male jail. Jail for men only. And so that particular wing became a debtor's prison and a prison for people who may not be mentally well. And so this Satan cell was occupied by a gentleman who allegedly was a Satanist. He would be heard to be um, speaking and chanting satanic spells while he was in there as he walked around the cell. He decorated a lot of the cell walls with satanic symbols. 
uh, and grew more and more agitated, of course, over time as he spent in there in solitary confinement. So at one point, apparently, he was kind of overheard by the other prisoners to say to Satan, please take my soul, I will do anything, please get me out of here, I cannot spend a moment in here any longer. And what he did was he set himself on fire. So he self-immolated, what that's called, and he literally burnt himself alive within the cell. But he made a deal with the devil first. Oh, He made a deal with the devil first to take his soul, yep. And so no one went in to save him. Uh, Apparently, they just let it go, whatever it was. It must have been too dangerous or too way out there for anyone to do anything. Um, But afterwards, a prison guard was assigned to go in and clean up the mess. Oh. Now, this is where the story changes a bit, and it depends on what what story you read from Google to what information you get. Um, Apparently, there was this darkness that was all over the cell except for one spot on the wall, which there was like an outline of a human being, the shape of a human that was on one part of the wall, which the background of it was completely blank and the original color of the wall, but everything else was just covered in this black you know, the the stuff that would have emanated from this man while he was burning. So smoke and dust and whatever it was. Yeah, evil, evil, nasty dust from Satan. Yes. And all that was left of this man were, you know, a a few bits of clothing and, and that's about it. So this particular prison guard was assigned to clean the cell up. Uh, And apparently after having done this, the cell was closed and it wasn't reopened for at least 15, 20 years. It was kept closed the whole time. But this particular prison guard was so overcome by what he had encountered within the cell that he later took his own life by slashing his wrists. He went into the bathroom at the jail, broke the bathroom mirror and used the pieces of the mirror to slash his wrists writing in blood on the wall that Satan was to take me to the only thing I could do was take my own life. That is an unbelievable story. And I just, I, I can't help but think that the guards around Satan's cell let that guy burn because he was a super creepy evil guy and no one wanted anything to do with it. And this poor man who I, I've, I've, I've read the Google stories and Apparently, he was like a well-liked, level-headed, happy family man. And he was just overcome by this evil in the room. It's so scary. Yeah. Now, tell me, have you been in there, Renata? Oh, we take tours in there all the time. Oh. <laughs> we take people into there. Every single tour we do, we take, we, we say to, we tell people the, the legend. And, of course, the, the jail has now, unfortunately, cleaned that cell up. So you can't see anything on the walls anymore. It's a nice, pretty cream color. <laughs> and everything's been taken off the walls, which is so sad because, really, it's part of you know the, the fabric of the jail. They painted over the remnants of Satan and, and the combustion. Yes. That's right. But we, we know that it, most people that come into Maitland Jail want to know and want to see where that cell is. So we do take people in. Um, we do ask people if they want to spend a moment of time in there as we tell the story to please follow us in and we will tell the story while we are in there. Um, sometimes we will take people in without telling them anything at all and just say, what do you get? by being in this particular cell? Is it any different from any others? And some people will say, no, nah, didn't feel a thing. But yet some people have actually walked out going, I smell smoke. <gasps> no! Or, yes, or I feel really creeped out in there. I don't know what it is. I just feel really creepy. And we try not to front load them by giving them any information. So, you know, sometimes we'll do that. Sometimes <sighs> we'll just, Tell, tell them the story and, you know, that's, that's the way they want it. So it really depends on, on the group and what they're looking for. 
Oh, and they leave smelling barbecue. Oh, Renata, have you ever felt anything in there? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> I've had some of my own weird and wonderful experiences. I, I was accosted in one of the bathrooms um, one time about four or five months ago. Oh, my God. Um, by some energy that was quite, yeah, quite intimidating. Um and, yeah, that was a bit of an experience. I sort of walked out and went, well, that was weird. Don't anyone go into that bathroom tonight? <laughs> oh. um, so, yes, weird things happen. And sometimes you can go months without anything personally happen- happening. But sometimes what we try and do, is we have particular cells where we set equipment up so it's ready for our visitors. But we also have spaces that we do not enter until we walk in with our guests. So we really want all the energy that is in there to be left undisturbed. And we walk into those spaces first thing when we walk in. And you, sometimes the, the energy is palpable. It's like they're all there staring at you going, hi, we're waiting. <laughs> and sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes there is just absolutely nothing. And it really literally, literally feels dead. Oh, my God. So there were a lot of famous escape attempts at the jail. Can you tell me anything about the escape attempts? Um, well, again, in Sea Wing, there was one particular cell where a group of gentlemen wanted to dig their way out under the jail wall. And where Sea Wing is, it's probably the closest to one of the back walls of any of the wings. Uh, and so they started to dig a tunnel and they actually covered the, the tunnel with a piece of linoleum that fitted over the top so that you couldn't see where the tunnel was. And they used to take the dirt out when they were going exercising in socks and pillowcases. And they got quite close, um, except that they were dobbed in. Someone told um, the wardens, the prison guards, of what was happening. And, um, of course, they had to pay a major um, thing of spending more time, of course, in in jail for trying to escape. And, of course, they were all um, then separated and the hole was covered up and the cell was closed for a while until they fixed it all up and filled it all with concrete. Um, The problem with that was that they did not know that the jail wall actually extended below the ground as far as it did. So even if they got to the wall, they would have had to then dig underneath it, which would have taken them probably as much time as digging to where they got in the first place. And the other one was uh, a major escape attempt from the shower block, which was um, through an air vent. Now, the the shower block was also quite new in the history of the jail. It it wasn't there for too long. Um, And it was built, unfortunately, outside the structure. So the the prisoners understood that this was probably their best possibility of escaping. And uh, so, and if you look at the uh, air vents, they are tiny. So how men could scamper up those air vents and escape is absolutely fascinating. The shower blocks were never, the shower block itself was never an area where the, the police walked into. They stayed outside. So any of the prisoners going in, and it was only a period of time every day when the shower block um, was operational, um, any prisoners going in literally had the, the space to themselves. They would beat up other people in there. Um, there were knifings in there. Um, you know, drugs would be sold and exchanged in there. You know, there was a whole lot of stuff going on in that shower block. And uh, it's actually quite an interesting place to investigate as well. We always take people to the shower block too. Oh, vicious, vicious. I want to know what happened to the guy who informed the warden about the tunnel. Because to me, he's a dead guy. <laughs> even I know you can't grouse. Oh, yeah. So you can't even imagine they, the stories about you taking off because um, there uh, is an external door. On, on, it's a very old jail. So they had external lead doors and then they had an internal uh, iron grate. So the iron grate, which extended the whole uh, length of the door and width of the door, was there so that the main lead door could be opened 
and air could circulate into the cells because there's only a small gap at the very top of each of the cells for air to circulate through. So sometimes they would open up the, the front big door and just have that iron grate um, so that you know no prisoner could walk out without that being opened by a prison guard. And there's also a story of um, one man actually being murdered because one of the prisoners, in his rage, tore that iron grate off the off the door cavity and squashed him under it, like making a toasted sandwich, and killed him that way by literally squeezing him to death. So Whoa. there were types in there that were just. Unbelievable. There were people who were murdered in the cells by being squashed between mattresses so that they couldn't breathe and they suffocated. There were men that actually hung themselves in the cells while the other prisoners that were in there just turned their backs and pretended it wasn't happening. Because as time progressed, some of those cells were occupied by three or four men at a time because there was no space. Um, So, you know, you had the horrific things happening in their cells while the other prisoners literally just turned their backs and went, I didn't see anything. So let's go back to um, you being attacked in the bathroom. So you're attacked by an unseen force and you know it's a male energy. That's got to be scary. How do you fend off an unseen attacker who's coming at you? Um, I have to say that it lasted just a few seconds. And then by that stage, I literally grabbed the door handle of the the toilet because I was in the toilet and I walked out. But it was in quite an uncompromising position as well, if you can imagine uh, what you're doing when you're in the toilet, right? So yeah. I, I, it, I was at my most vulnerable and that, that's where they got me because I I tend to put up a very strong – um, attitude when I'm in there because, of course, the ghost tour guys are supposed to be the ones that can handle every situation, right? So you go in with this sense of, okay, I'm here, I'm in control, I'm doing what I need to do, and I'm going to make sure everyone is safe. So, of course, I wasn't thinking of that when I was going into the toilet. I was just thinking of doing what I needed to do. And so that's when they got me and went, okay, let's see how tough you are. So, again, in that space, you have to be tougher than they are because this is old prison style. If you show weakness, they're going to know they have a way in. So you mustn't show weakness, and that's the most important thing. When I go to Maitland, I'm not going to show weakness, but I'm also not going to go to the toilet because even if someone doesn't (laughs) grab me or touch me, they'll be watching me, and I don't want that. I don't want some creepy ghost guy watching me. Yikes. (laughs) Yikes. <laughs> oh, we've had people going into the toilet in pairs. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, you must come to Maitland Jail. I would be very, very happy to take you through. Very happy. All the jails in, in Australia, all the historic jails in Australia are absolutely fascinating from the point of view that they very much relied on the same type of structure and build as the old English jails um, over in England. And so um, it's kind of this resettling of that old type of incarceration um, from England over to Australia. And so if you walk into an old jail in um uh, Newcastle, in sorry, in Maitland or in Sydney or down in Melbourne, you're it's actually like walking into an old jail over in England. Very much the same same when they were built um, initially in those early 1800s. So it's a great snapshot of you know the the type of horrendous circumstances that these people were in. I mean, there was no running water in any of the cells. There was only a bucket. Um, that was in the cell, which would have been for their toileting. And there was also another bucket for um, their water supply. Um, You know, there was no electricity, so they were in there by candlelight, if any light was allowed at all. Um, In the early years, when even the women and children were brought in, in those first years in the 1850s, 60s and 70s, they slept on concrete floors. You can imagine how cold or how hot it would have been. 
Um, and uh, only after a number of years were they given hammocks to sleep in. And then, of course, later on in the 1900s, they introduced um, mattresses and uh, a wire bed. And in Australia, you have big spiders. And rats. And rats. And you rats. have rats too? Oh my goodness. No wonder there's so many ghosts in these jails. These guys were unhappy, <laughs> miserable, nasty guys, and they're hanging around these jails. Wow. Can you tell me more about the women's area of the prison? Do you have any paranormal experiences in the women's area? Yes. Um, first of all, the, the women were brought into what was known as A Wing, which was the first wing of the jail that was built. And the women were kept upstairs and the men were kept downstairs. So, of course, that was for reasons that we can just assume. Um, never for the two sexes to meet at any point in time. And the women had to walk up these stairs and walk along this little corridor that had no uh, railing along it at all. It was just this open concrete walkway into their cell. So we certainly have a number of stories of, of women losing grip on their children and these poor darlings falling, you know, one floor down onto concrete no. and the mothers going after them um, and, of course, dying in the fall. So, you know, those stories. I would have done the same thing. I would have just jumped off. If my kid, my, my kid fell and it's my first day of prison, I would have just jumped off. I couldn't live with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's horrifying. And um, we also find that many women connect with females that were there. And we've had some women who actually, um, we take them around into Sea Wing, which was originally uh, all spe specifically built for the women. And uh, we, of course, tell them uh, later on that some of the women were pregnant when they came in and some babies were born there. But prior to that, some women do say that they have tummy issues or that they feel pain in their stomach and that's kind of then when we sort of say well you do know some women were actually pregnant while they were here and they were saying oh that's what it actually feels like it feels like pain so the, the, it is there are great connections that are made between the living and the dead depending on the frame of mind and how open they are to have experiences Yep. So you can certainly walk into these spaces and go, nope, nope, I'm closing down. I'm just here to hear the stories and I don't want to have anything. You know, I don't want to feel anything, don't want to see anything. Uh, and there are others that walk in with the greatest desire of going, no, I, I, want, to, I want to feel, I want to know what um, happens from, you know, this, this really personal perspective. And they really open themselves up and engage. And that's when the most amazing things happen. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Renata, for coming on with us and telling the fascinating stories about Maitland. It's intriguing. Do you have a creepy true crime or paranormal story that you would like to share on Amy Keeps a Creepy? I know you do. Please email a brief description of your story to info at creepypodcast.com. I can't wait to get creeped out. Thank you for listening. Toxic content. Toxic content.